Well, first Holmes was born, then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. Stop, Holmes. Beware, your host, Jonathan Holmes. Thank you, Sid of Stars, always, for the fine introduction. And we have Zach Gage on the show. I'd like to think of a fine introduction for you, Zach, but I ugh, can't think of any right That's now. okay. You sure? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're understanding, but also honest. You deserved better than that. I'm sorry. That's all I had. Uh, yeah. How are you doing? What have, You just uh, got back from PAX, I've heard. Yeah, we uh, we drove here in five days from Seattle, so I'm in New York, so it was pretty crazy. Um, yeah, that's intense. But uh, it's good. We're all battling getting sick and uh, and getting ready to cram on Ridiculous Fishing. We finished yeah, you're up. working on that with um, the guys from Vlam Beer, right? Yep, and Greg Wolwin from Mike and Greg. Awesome. That's, uh, that's uh, what they call a super group. You guys yeah. are like the traveling Wilburys of video game design. You're working on a fishing game. It's amazing. I, hope so. <laughs> I, I think so. so. It's one man's opinion. I think so. It's funny. A lot of people are talking about fishing games. Last week's guest, Sophie Holden, said that her dream game, if she had like maximum budget, like a Gears of War budget, she'd make a game where all you do is interact with objects via a fishing rod and fish for them. So you're, like, you're uh, like in real life or in a video game. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like in, in a, a video game, but it was fairly realistic. She's like, you'd catch planes with a fishing rod and people, oh, and you'd get into like, a, it's almost like the combat system would be replaced with a fishing system. I forgot to ask her if people could fish for you. That's That'd crazy. Be even better. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to make a game where it was a, a, an augmented reality fishing game, and you, you could only play it in a boat in the middle of the ocean, and it would check to see if you were in a boat in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> that, would, that would be uh, that'd be pretty incredible. Would that be like iPad, I guess? Cause you can yeah, I don't know. I think you could like Google Maps and just see if you were like in a lake or the ocean or not, and then just let you play. It wow. sounds totally doable, but also stupid. So, no, but that would force people to actually go outside and do stuff. Yeah, I like the idea of using technology to force people to basically go fishing, but then play a video game about fishing instead. <laughs> we need to talk about how interesting you are. And how did you become so interesting? Have you always been like this? Or did it? Did you like hit a uh, turning point in your life where you're like, now I'm going to make all this incredible stuff? And all different kinds of stuff, too. Everything from installation art to, to uh, video games to, to, to paintings to the, the works. Yeah. When did it all start for you, this being interesting? Uh, I don't know. I've always been loud, I think, with ideas. But I don't know if they've always been interesting. Um, but I've been making stuff forever um, since, like, I actually asked my mom because I was trying to figure out when I started making games uh, because I was going to be on a panel with Baby Castles about, like, when game making started and how that worked. And uh, she said that when I was in pre-K... I would boss all the other kids around into playing games, and they had to teach all the other kids that they didn't have to listen to me because they were having fun. I don't know. It sounds creepy now. <laughs> but I guess a long time ago. Oh. Oh. Huh. And so it, you, it sounds like you've got an extra version to you as well, and a lot of people who design games that I've met anyway, I hate to buy into the stereotype, but it's often true that they, they like to focus on, on something that's predictable, like a video game or a computer, oh. whereas dealing with people, you've got all these variables, and it's kind of a mess, and a lot of uh, really dedicated programmers I know have avoided that, but it sounds like you've been uh, interacting with people a lot in your work as well. I think like I really like interacting with people when we're actually talking about something that, that I feel like is meaningful. Like I'm not so big on small talk, and if you drop me in a bar with strangers, I don't really, I just hide in the corner, but, like, mm -hmm. I think if I can, like, build a framework where I know that the conversation I'm going to have with someone is, like, going to have content, then I'm really into talking. Huh. So, making stuff kind of helps give you a framework sometimes to talk to people about something meaningful as opposed to just sports and sandwiches <laughs> and stuff. Well, sandwiches are pretty meaningful. I don't know. 
<laughs> I had this boss once who would just be like, I'd be like, how are you? And he'd be like, fine. I'm like, what do you want to talk about? And he's like, bread. Let's talk about different kinds of bread. And I'm like, oh. Nice guy, but it, it hurt. It hurt bad. I wish he'd played more of your games. That might have helped us to talk about Did he have a lot to say about bread? I mean, what? Just like, he'd be like, I went to Bertucci's, and their bread is really good. Like, indeed it is. He's like, yes, it is good. I just just learned, actually, about bread, that you can, there's a way to make uh, dough so that it captures yeast out of the air. You can make bread without yeast entirely, and it'll just capture the yeast. And then you can, like, chop a piece off and make bread with it, and then the rest of it will keep capturing yeast, and you can use, like, the same starter to make bread forever without, like, ever getting yeast from the store. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that, too. There's, like, some bread whose father was born in, like, the 1900s, but it just keeps reproducing itself, and they've still got the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting way to talk about bread. I'm already happier to be talking to you than I was to my old boss, who was a fine man, just a kind of a, a Ken doll of a man who loved bread. Um, and you're reinventing the way people chat with each other on Instant Messenger. That's another thing I noticed you're doing. Tell us about that. Well, more pos- postulating a, a new way, I guess. I don't know. I, I really like... Um, so the project you're talking about is this uh, thing I did about six or eight months ago called Can We Talk? Um, and the idea was that... Uh, so I grew up um, probably like like a lot of people. That's, of course, a lot of people. So my whole generation... Like, I'm, I'm 27, so when I was um, in middle school... Uh, the social internet was sort of showing up and growing. And so, like, I was, like, maturing with the social internet. Like, um, AOL Instant Messenger released its, like, standalone application when I was in, like, sixth grade. So suddenly everybody could be on AOL and talk to each other. Um, And that was really, like, Mm. formative and weird. Like, I remember learning about, like, talking to girls and stuff and being informed that, like, if you talk to a girl on Instant Messenger that was cheating, like, that didn't count. Um, but so like I have this weird relationship with text chat because everybody would still talk to girls on instant messenger because it was like way more comfortable if you were afraid to approach someone. Um, and then text chat kind of evolved and then it evolved again recently where now everybody uses mobile phones. Um, but it's weird to me that like text chat has been evolving, but then Skype came in and then all the technology pushes went towards like video chat, um, which is... Mm doesn't make a lot of sense because everybody's still using text chat so much and text is such an important way to um, communicate with each other because it allows you to say things that you might be uncomfortable with. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's, like, not good. But uh, Can We Talk started as this idea of, like, what would a text chat program need to be like if you needed to, like, break up with your girlfriend over a text chat? Like, what would be the appropriate program for that? Um, and so the, the programs we have now are really great. Um, not for breaking up with your girlfriend, but just great in general. Uh, But they have this one major problem, which is that you can't, um, when there's silence, there's really no understanding. Like, it's just a gap. Like, if I said something really weird to you and you didn't respond, I don't know if you're, like, crying or flipping out or, like, in the kitchen grabbing a beer. Like, there's no understanding of, like, what the pauses mean. Um, And pauses are so important when you're having an intense conversation. So the project Mm -hmm. that I did, this is a really long explanation, by the way. So the project that I did was uh, an idea of oh, how to make good, a, text, a, a text chat program that had all of the things that we like about text chat, like it's not face-to-face, it's, you can bring up uncomfortable situations, but solves the issue of silences being ambiguous. And so the program that I made uh, uses face detection in like a pretty robust way and also knows where the application is on the screen relative to other applications, so it knows if it's in the background or partially obscured. Uh, And then it kind of adds all that information together and uses that to adjust the opacity of the name of the person you're talking to. So you can kind of see if they've gotten up and left the computer or if they're browsing around on the Internet and talking to you at the same time. So you can have, like, a a, a more complete conversation. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) See, this is working. That's awesome. It's it's, it's, it's I figure that a lot of people would be scared to use it, though. Yeah, um, what, probably. What's happening? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I think there may have been some lag. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
I think uh, probably, yeah, people are scared to use it. It's built so that you could use it if you want to, but a lot of my projects are not really meant to be solutions to anything. They're more meant to, like, point out a weird thing that, that is really odd or important or strange about the way that we're interacting with each other and just, like, built out just enough to be real so that you can have a conversation about it, but not so real that I'm going to market it and try and make a venture-funded startup and make a bajillion dollars or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's your career, if, if you don't mind me calling it that, is interesting to go through your whole history, and people who haven't should definitely check out your website and check out uh, the, the kind of progression of your work because you've hit this point recently where it seems like you're, you're ready to make some money. Like you did all of these really interesting things for a long time that, and you're still doing them now, don't get me wrong, but you're balancing them more now with actual profit deals, which, uh, which I suppose makes sense. Was that a, a difficult thing to, to have to take on, this idea that now at this age, at this point in your life, it's, you have to start turning it into something to sustain yourself with? I think it was difficult, but not in any particularly unique way. Like, I think that's something everybody kind of deals with once they get out of college or grad school and they're on their own and you have to suddenly realize that you need to make money with things. Um, I've been trying to kind of have successful financial stuff for, like, two years or three years now, and it's really been tough. I think until Spell Tower, that was something that was really mm -hmm. successful. Um, and it's been really interesting trying to like grapple with those questions like I think one thing that that was difficult before Spell Tower was successful is I had a number of things that had sort of uh, critical acclaim and people were talking about them mm -hmm. um, and excited but there wasn't uh, but they weren't making money they didn't have any kind of mass appeal and like as an artist just trying to be pure and make things that express myself I guess like it's weird how much that starts to wear on you and it was really bizarre for me to be uncomfortable like I didn't want to be um, an artist who people look back and, and no one no one has played any of the things that I've done but other artists are like oh that guy was cool like I really liked his stuff um, and so in that way like finding financial success with Spell Tower was really uh, cool and validating in a way that I, I wouldn't have expected uh, before doing that. But I, it definitely also is scary. I, like, I don't want to go too far. Like there are ways to make tons of money, and I want to make sure I'm a little grounded. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be interesting. I too, and this is going to sound pretty pretty conceited, but I feel the same way about uh, writing and doing internet videos about video games. There's stuff I know I could do to probably multiply my hits by five or ten, but it would just be yuck. Yeah. Uh, and Spell Tower is not yuck at all. For people who haven't played it, it's like a, a game for people who don't like video games, except it is a video game, and it's great. Thanks. I guess that's the right <laughs> review. Is that, is that, it's, uh, it, it combines, I would say, kind of Tetris with Words with Friends, except um, it doesn't have kind of the mindless competitive aspect to it. But uh, that's my uh, take on it. Why don't you, if you don't mind, explain the game to the people who might not have played it? I think I think that's a pretty good take. I mean, the the real idea was to like build a game that was as as respectable as Crosswords, but was a video game. So like, mm -hmm. um, I've been trying to make. I really like really difficult games. Like I've been hooked on uh, Super Hexagon for the for the past two days, basically. Um, and I think a lot of the games that I've been making, like BitPilot or, or Unify, like they're all hard and they're all about kind of conquering that difficulty and uh, finding ways to explore the system that I'm presenting people with uh, and get so comfortable and learn enough that you can sort of prove that you're, you're, you have mastery over it and then you can kind of beat the game. Um, and I think that's in a lot of ways really important for games, like that's one of the strengths of games is that it's something that you can prove your mastery over. Um, and that's mm -hmm. like, like a major quality of the medium. So I really like to use it, but it's been hard, especially on the iPhone, because uh, they're just a lot of people just want to uh, take a game and do some things with their fingers and have it make noises because they work all day. And so when they come home, they don't want to, you know, work. Uh, 
Mm. So it was sort of interesting when I was looking at word games and I realized that like crosswords is a really phenomenally popular game, but it's also incredibly hard, like horribly, horribly difficult. Mm. Um, and so when I got into trying to make this word game, it was sort of a nice uh, space to be because all of a sudden a lot of the things that I appreciate, like really uh, difficult things that tax your brain and making games that are just shapes and colors, like those are all really valid in the word game space and that's what people kind of like and, and want to respect in a way that isn't so uh, broadly applicable in, in other video game mediums. I guess I didn't really explain what Spell Tower was at all. <laughs> um, no, but you did better than that. You explained the reasoning behind making it and, and why it succeeded. I would have never thought of that. Because people think of the word games... Um, crowd, if you will, as casual gamers who don't really want challenge and whatnot, which is a, uh, I hate the word, I hate any categorization of games that uh, inherently sends a message of how much you respect the games in that category. Casual, hardcore, art game, ugh, they all make me feel yuck. And and because you actually respected the uh, art, I mean the, uh, the word games uh, genre, and the people that play them and their uh, ability to deal with challenge, which is something you're interested in, you uh, took that respect and made a very respectable, great game out of it that sold sold pretty well. It was number three on the uh, iOS uh, marketplace for a little while, right? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it's over 200,000 downloads, so it's done really, really well. Uh, which is exciting. And it's still selling, or did everyone... Yes, stop? no, it's still pretty good every day. I don't know. Someday it will stop. Um, hopefully I will update it before then. But do you, uh, Would you ever bring it to other consoles other than iOS? Yeah, uh, it's going to come out on Android later this month, and I've been playing with, like, I kind of would like to bring it to 3DS, or Vita, but um, we'll see what happens. Porting is a really big job, especially for one person. Um, and so I've been yeah. kind of feeling around to see what's possible and what is like financially viable um, for me to pay someone to port it and what systems work. Um, but I have a really, like, someday, I have this arcade cabinet that I built in my house, and I really want to make a two-player, the like two-player version of Spell Tower that's in it by a Bluetooth. I really think, like, on a single screen, like Tetris Attack, with two people standing next to each other with joysticks would just be, like, completely awesome. Um, so maybe that will happen. Wow. Do you think that could get in the Winnie-tron, maybe? Yeah, great. maybe. I mean, if I did it, it would compile for PC, so I, I would definitely send it over to those guys. Um, if wow, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I would eat that up. And I know 3DS porting guys who I don't think they would charge you anything, but they wouldn't, you just wouldn't get as much money when it actually comes out on 3DS. They would oh, that's interesting. It. Yeah, maybe yeah I, I could put you in touch with those dudes. That might be, that might be, uh, that might be good. I did, I did talk to a guy who's really good, but I would have to pay him up front, and that was scary. So, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, yeah, that might be fun to, to talk about. Awesome, I'll put you in touch with them after yeah, the show. Good. Not right now, that would be awkward. We just had a business <laughs> meeting on <laughs> our podcast. Yeah, so you've had this idea. One of the things that unifies all of your projects, from what I can tell, is you'll change up the rules for the people that are experiencing it. Your uh, your sound installation you did in museums that that just made iPhone noises. Yeah, <laughs> that was when did did you really do that? When did you do that? And, and yeah. what museum was that in? Uh, it was in a gallery up in uh, Montreal uh, a couple months ago, um, and it was it was weird. <laughs> um, that project uh, that project was actually inspired by a number of projects that I saw um, a couple of years ago. I took a trip to China um, when I was in graduate school, and there are these. There's this one group of artists that I thought was totally phenomenal because they would only do projects that would like. Um, take over the install the entire gallery. Their idea was that they wanted to like do a project that would interact with everybody else's artwork and not just be an artwork on the wall. Um, so when I saw it, it was just they had spilled like like uh, 10,000 small glass beads in the gallery. So everywhere you walked, it was just horribly dangerous. This could only happen in China. Um, so like the whole time you're in this gallery, you're just really uncomfortable. And I thought that was just so completely awesome that they had like 
reconceptualize the area. And apparently they had done a previous installation, which was just like a curtain of rotting fish that you had to walk through. So everybody in the gallery smelled terrible. Um, which, so, so my uh, like American Americanized version was to, to do a performance where it was this small box that plays the text message alert sound. Um, and the idea was that uh, everybody in the gallery would think they were receiving text messages, so they'd be checking their pockets or looking around angrily um, all the time, and that would be like the performance. <laughs> How did that go over? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what do you think uh, inspired you to want to affect people in that way, to... to hopefully give them some insight on themselves in the process, but, but also you're, you're, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a troll post at the same it is time. Kind of a, yeah, I guess it is kind of trolling. Uh, I, I think, like, I, it's, it's hard to, like, look back and find all the themes, but I kind of have this obsession with, um, with systems and with just trying to get people to talk about interesting things and to think about the stuff that's going on around them in a way that you kind of don't when you're just casually experiencing it. Um, and the easiest way that I've found mm -hmm. to do that is to do something small um, that's funny right off the bat or weird right off the bat that, like, looks at some system, breaks it down to its rules, and then, like, reconfigures the rules that are there and turns them into something that you don't understand. So, like, mm -hmm. the first thing that happens when you see it is you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And then your brain is, like, open to receiving information. Uh, and then you kind of interact with it, and then you go, that was weird or funny or strange, and then you mm -hmm. leave, and you talk to your friends about it. But the discussion isn't just, I saw this beautiful painting. It's, this really weird thing happened to me. I was in a gallery, and this box like made noises, and it was really annoying. And then your friend is like, oh, that's weird. What do you, you know, like it, it starts a conversation as opposed to just like trying to show you something beautiful or weird. Mm -hmm. Right, and it, it, it forces your mind into a perspective where you have to analyze yourself and, and your surroundings a little bit and be ready to be challenged, which is something I see little kids do all the time. The more I hang around with uh, little kids, uh, I'm at the age now where a lot of my friends have them, the more I see that they're just ready to analyze and be challenged and put up with not having something be immediately palatable in a way that I don't think a lot of adults have anymore. And I think that's also why a lot of old, difficult games, kind of like the games you would make, like um, BitPilot, little kids will play those games for hours and just right. die and die and die and die and be like, this is still really fun. Whereas adults oftentimes will, they want the easy mode uh, right away or just no difficulty at all. Like, uh, do people even die in Mass Effect? Is that a game where you lose, or you just... I died in the first one, but never in any of the other ones. Mm, but yeah. 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 Here, uh, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. I'm going to bust out my theory real quick, because I think it segues, but I definitely want to talk about Black Mario, too. Oh, cool. I forget. <laughs> so, yeah, a little mental note about Black Mario. Uh, I have this idea that I've almost talked about on the show for, like, a month, that religion was the first gamification of regular life because uh, video games uh, as an anthropy de de defines them are just uh, it's an experience uh, created by rules right. and also they usually have a mythology attached to them uh, video games do anyway tetris doesn't but a lot of games do uh in fact some people did make up a mythology for tetris each like shape has a different uh, character and stuff like that but anyway uh, religion's the same thing it's just a set of rules with a mythology attached and out of all the different kinds of uh, art, at least I think of religion as art, because art is something that human beings use to put our ideas, our philosophies, our, our uh, opinions about what humanity is all about and our experiences into the minds of others. So you can, you know, telling a great speech will cause everyone in the crowd to all kind of have the same thoughts and feelings in their head. And, right. and that's what art does. And that's what religion certainly does. It's a way to unify people under one moral code and, and one belief system. And I think video games often do that too. You have to play by the rules of the developer. And for some reason, people all get drawn to the same set of rules, like the Call of Duty rules. People just love them for some reason. I think, people. It's weird. I, 
I think I'll buy that. I don't know. Gamification is a really iffy word because uh, it means mm. a lot of different things. But I, I do think that, like, one thing from my extremely limited experience with religion that was sort of interesting to realize is that, like, religion is its not really... Uh, like, the easiest way for me to understand it is that it's a framework of rules that you contextualize everything else in your life under. And that's why it's so hard to kind of, like, ask questions about a religion that you believe in because you're asking questions about the thing that you're inside because everything you, you do is coming through this framework, or at least as I understand religion. Um, and I think, like, games at their purest mm. forms are, are also a framework. Like, playing chess, the experience that you get playing chess is not... It's not the part of chess that is the game that's passed down. The part of chess that's the game that's passed down is the framework to have an experience through. It's the places and the pieces and how they mm. move and what those rules are. And then you operate within that framework and you have an experience. And I, and I think in that way, like it, it, I could totally see how a religion would be similar. Yeah, I don't. I, oof, now I'm worried I might have offended somebody. <laughs> I'm not uh, trying to say that religion isn't valid and people don't believe in oh, it no. just because it's all true. But right. it, it is. There is something to the magic of presenting people with a bunch of rules and telling them, "We're not going to pay you for following these rules. You're not going to get in great shape from following these rules. You're not going to get sexy and rich. You should just follow them because it's good to do." And the video games do that. They just present you with a bunch of rules and like, this will be good. And uh, religion does it too with no guaranteed payoff. And yet people get into both of them pretty, pretty deeply. I don't know if you're familiar with the Legend of Zelda fan base, like the Die Hard fans or Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. Wow. Wow. If you say anything bad about Sonic the Hedgehog to them, they will tear your face off with their teeth. Well, I mean... But I think that's that's what's compelling about a about a good framework is it's it's a thing that you know is going to give you experiences that that you want to be a part of, and I think that's true mm -hmm. of games and, and, and anything else with a set of rules. So, so sure, maybe, sure. I don't I don't want to accidentally offend. That religion is scary. <laughs> yeah, I know that's the thing. I don't want to re re offend uh, religious people or Sonic the Hedgehog fans because. Right. Exactly. They are equally vehement in there. But, you know, I mean, no, new, no offense. You guys, nothing but respect. It's just uh, I'm trying to figure it all out. And why not try to do that with, with Zach Gage? You know, sure. guys, you do the same thing in my shoes. I wonder if we have any questions left. I'm going to ask the people that are asking questions. Questions? And Black Mario, let's talk about that. You did a Black Mario hack. I did. Speaking of offensive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> I think that project. I there's no possible way I I could talk about that and see uh, and explain why why it's important. I think a, a white dude doing a a game about about um, sort of anything having to do with race is just totally bullshit. Uh, if I tried to explain it, but uh, I don't know. It just it, well, I was sort of <laughs> I was just yep. playing around, kind of kind of with with. Uh, ROM hacks, and I was like, well, what if, like, I was looking at the color palette that I could, like, pick from to change things, and I thought, like, well, uh, wh what if Mario was black? Like, how would that change things? Would that change anything? I don't even know. Um, and I Googled it, and no one had done it, so I just did it, and that was, that's basically that project. When did you... That's funny, because I played... Not to say your idea is an original. Oh, no, there could totally be one. Uh, back on the Dreamcast era, I hacked my Dreamcast to play... Super Negro Brothers, I believe it was called. Oh, crazy. <laughs> yeah, and it was unlike your hack. Not only was Mario black, but he was bald. He looked kind of like uh, Michael Jordan, and all he fought was clan members and stuff like that. It was, you know... Uh, and what I thought was interesting was your game, you didn't change anything other than the right. fact that Mario now has brown skin, which actually made me think at first, like, he ripped me off. Where's like the where where's the fried chicken and and watermelons and stuff like that? I can say that because I'm, I'm not white, which is neat. Right. I love being able to get away with that. Uh, but I wanted to see you like take on the whole idea of race harder, and that in itself was interesting because that made me think: Why would I want him to like add more gimmicks so I can be like more offended or just so I'm getting more of a message? And it made me realize how loaded I expect every racial discussion to be. Instead of just, hey, what if 
Mario had brown skin? Would that affect the fact that he's a cultural icon? Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe people wouldn't have cared. Maybe it would have been uh, just as popular of a character. Uh, yeah, so that, we hate about uh, Japanese guys, and yet he's white. Yeah, that's weird. That huh. stuff was definitely you know, intentional to like keep it. I mean, especially from my perspective, like I, even if I had wanted to add in those things, I think it would have been horribly dangerous and potentially really offensive if if I had mm. done that. But but I didn't. I wanted to just make like one change and say like, what if it was this? You know, is there a conversation to have here? Right, right. And leaving the space open gave me much more space to think about what it meant for myself instead of you shoving a bunch of stuff down my throat. So yeah, good on that. Yeah. Mario ROM hack. We've Sweet. got the questions. I'm going to ask them. Uh, Efford Agini asks, can you talk about the iPhone sound piece and how people reacted? Oh, we talked about that already. Rats. Uh, yeah, sorry. I'll we'll have to move okay. on from that. Uh, Pio Can Analog asks, save question mark. Don't do homework. Ah. What's that in the corner of the screen? Uh, that is, or even uh, the paper uh, above your head. Yeah, that what was, is that? Um, and this is your mom's house, right? Right. So I'm in the house that I grew up in right now. So I'm in my old room, um, and all the stuff that's around me is all the stuff from when I was in high school and middle school. Um, so that was somebody uh, somebody a couple of years ahead of me started some radical campaign where she was taking newspaper bits and writing on them and posting them all over the school. Uh, and that one said, uh, save paper, don't do homework. Um, and I thought it was funny, so I took it. And also, I probably had a crush on her. So, <laughs> huh? That sounds like the kind of girl you would have a crush on. She's yeah. also kind of breaking the rules, breaking the right. frameworks a bit, rearranging them. That's neat. Uh, another question from Slow Holmes: Do you think modal difficulty is a good system? There have been some contention on the topic, especially in relation to Dark Souls. What are your opinions, reservations on modal and organic difficulty? Uh, what does modal mean? Is that like one area is harder than the other area and you're making your own decisions? Or I'm not totally sure. Rats, I thought I knew what it meant, but now I'm afraid I'm wrong. If you didn't know, you're the smart one in the family. And I, the, How can I know? I thought it was uh, modal difficulty is... Oh, like, you, like, like easy, medium, or hard mode? Yeah, I thought, well, I okay. know organic difficulty means it kind of changes as you play, at least that's right, how I right. use it, and adjust to how good or bad you might be. Whereas modal, uh, I thought, was just like, you know, picking a mode. Mm. Yeah, oh, I totally do have opinions on this, actually. Um, I go. think I, I've been really frustrated, actually, that games still have a selection where you have to pick what mode you want to play the game on before you start. I think it would be okay to have, like, an easy mode and a hard mode. Like, I want to just experience this, or I want this to be an intense experience. But the idea of anything in between those just seems super weird mm -hmm. to me because I haven't played the game. So, like, how am I supposed to judge between, like, hard or harder or hardest? Like, there's no... It feels like a, a decision that someone real, made, uh, like, way back when and nobody ever questioned it because it was just easier than providing a path through a game that would support any kind of player. And then everybody stuck with it. Um, like, even when you play, like, Super Mario Brothers. Like for Nintendo, it doesn't ask you how hard you want the game to be, but what it does is it gives you warp pipes and it gives you secret areas. So if you do want to play the game and skip to the hard part, you can find them and get there. And I think that's a whole lot more elegant than saying, hey, do you want this to be hard or easy? Um, so in my games that I make, I try and uh, try and keep it, if I'm going to have some kind of selection, just to two, like that Pilot has, has easy mode and normal mode. Um, and... Uh, and, and really, I, I try and not, not like to have that at all. Like, I think that it's mm. way more cool to just have the difficulty be organic or have mechanics in the game that allow you to judge the difficulty for yourself. Um, I think a really good example of that is in Doodle Jump, which was a whole lot smarter of a game than I expected it to be, um, the iPhone tilting game. Uh, and what they did in that, which was so brilliant, was the beginning is slow, and then it gets harder and harder, but spaced in the beginning are springs that jump you to a way harder part, and you have to be good to hit the springs. So when you're first learning the game, you just play through it, and it's kind of fun. Mm. But then when you get better, you can hit the springs and get to a part that's harder and more fun for you, and there's no point where you kind of feel like you're being cheated or you're wasting your time or you wanted to select a harder part. I thought that was really elegant.
Mm, yeah, it sounds great. I'll, I haven't played that. I, I really should. So, so in order to play the challenging parts, you need to be good enough to, to get to them, which is kind of how most games are designed, but sounds like they were smart enough to introduce that towards the beginning for people as well. Ah, that sounds great. To me, it's kind of like uh, when you meet, when you play a new game, it's like meeting a new person. You don't know what they're going to be like. And if I met a new friend and he was like, do you want me to be a dick or like a super dick, like a, such a jerk, I'd be like, I don't even know what that means by your standards. Like maybe your idea of being uh, like uh, one of my friends, Jim Sterling, he talks about uh, wanting to have sex with me in a rather forceful nature at least once a week. Uh, but to him, that's normal. So I don't take that as being being offensive. Uh, but it, it took a while to get to know him in order to, to gauge what that meant. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think video games should ask you how hard they want you to be. That's uh, it's up to the game to let you get to know it first, and then you can decide from there. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I drank too much coffee before the show. I'm sorry, Zach. I'm not going to talk anymore. This is your show no, from no, here on in. No, no, please. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I want to. I want to hear what you have to say. Sermon asks, "Do you ever play on the hardest setting, and how does that affect your play style in, let's say, a Western RPG?" Um, I definitely do play on the hardest setting, especially uh, in like uh, certain games. I that are some games I'll play on normal, but I like to play on hard if it makes sense, because hard usually is the game that engages you the most directly with the game system, um, and certain games are just not very good on normal and way better on hard. Like I felt like Halo 2 was a completely different game when you played it on Legendary and then when you played it normal. Um, and I remember that one specifically as like really enjoying it on hard. Um, and also uh, one of my friends, Simon Ferrari, wrote this really great piece for Kill Screen a long time ago um, about playing Modern Warfare 1 on hard and how the uh, enemy closets become really interesting when you're playing on hard because they force you to, instead of uh, laying, like waiting back and sniping, they force you to do what's actually kind of heroic, which is run into tons of enemy fire and really be freaked out and not want to do it, but have to do it anyway, um, which is not something that you typically do in, in a first-person shooter. Usually you hang back and pick everybody off and then move through. Mm -hmm. um, so that was cool. Uh, I don't really know if I've played many Western RPGs on hard... I haven't played a lot of Western RPGs lately, but I think I probably played Fallout 3 on hard um, just because that game was really easy to begin with and it felt like if I uh, mm. didn't play it on hard, I wouldn't be scared of things like Death Claws, which having played Fallout 1, like that was the best part of Fallout 1 was like really creeping around the perimeter of Death Claws and being terrified that one of them might see me and engage me in combat and rip me apart. I don't know. Yeah, you, you you have to risk losing excitement unless you play on hard. And sometimes just whole ideas get cut out. Like um, right. Mega Man 2 has normal or difficult. And uh, there's enemies that just don't have certain attack patterns, which were interesting concepts. They just cut out uh, when you play it on normal. That's the first time I think I felt ripped off by choosing the wrong difficulty. And ever since then, yeah, I'm afraid of picking the wrong choice before I even get to start the game. Uh, yeah, Mega Man 10, I think, the second one they released for WiiWare had an easy mode, and I played through it, and it was just, like, really embarrassing and weird, like, and uncomfortable. <laughs> like, the whole experience was awful. Yeah, as I recall, they just put platforms over all the spikes that could kill yeah. you. So you just walk straight and shoot and win. Yeah, and you could play as Proto Man, and he was, like, super powerful. So yeah, it's I, kind of I like, stuff. played through the whole game in like an hour and a half or something, and it was just not a Mega Man experience. It was really odd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of problems with Mega Man 10. I still like it, but but there's some issues for show. Uh, now we're at, from with the voice asks. Do you have an opinion on Steam Greenlight? Ah, boy, <laughs> everyone's talking about it constantly, and so uh, angry, and so and other people so kind of passionately defending it. It's uh, turning into this real schism in the small developer slash indie developer marketplace. And, uh, so I do. Yeah. Um, so I just got back to New York after doing this road trip from Seattle with uh, Rami Ismail from Blambeer and uh, Mike and Greg who did Gasketball and Solid Skier. And so that kind of hit right in the middle of our road trip and we were talking a lot about it in the car and we actually recorded a podcast about it. Um, which is our Twitter was at Week of Hatred. 
um, and we have a link to it on there if if you guys, if anybody wants to listen to the podcast. But basically, we uh, found out that we were having a really hard time talking about it at $100 because $100 is really contentious because a lot of people don't think that's a lot of money, and then a lot of people think it is a lot of money, and it felt like that was just distracting everybody from a real issue. Um, so we pretended that it was $1,000 and then had a conversation about it as like it was $1,000 per game. Um, it was like a thought experiment. But I think what we ended up coming to uh, is just that it feels like the problem in the situation is that Steam isn't really clear right now as to what they want the service to be. Is it uh, like a closed service like Xbox Live? Is it a totally open service like Xbox Live Indies? If it's somewhere in the middle, like where does where is that middle? And I think a lot of people want it to be a lot of different things. And because it's unclear, that's causing all sorts of problems. And I don't know that the $100 is really the issue. I think that there's just a lot of other stuff. And people are latching on to the $100 because now we're being asked to pay money for something we don't understand. And so that brought everything kind of to the forefront. Mm. Yeah, yeah. To, to me, there's been a lot of feelings about Steam bubbling up for people, and this was kind of the the pin that pricked the boil. And now all this pus of emotion is bursted all over my computer screen, hearing people say, you know, the Steam are elitist bastards for charging $100, when what they really mean is I've always been angry that Steam is the only place that small games sell, and it's not fair that they're such a huge marketplace where other people love what Steam has done and are quick to defend the whole $100 thing. It's been quite a thing. Do you, do you have any feelings about Steam, either way? I mean, it seems pretty nice to me. I've bought games on it. I like it, but I don't... I think there's, you know... There are a lot of places to sell games, and there are a lot of ways to get your game out there. Um, I mean, if you're just talking... I mean, the, the, that's what's so great about the Internet. It seems weird to me that... Well, I hope nobody yells at me. Um, it seems weird to me that people are people are so gung ho about getting their game on Steam when we have the internet, and the internet is such a great place mm. to sell things. And like, sure, it'd be great to have the marketing power of Steam behind you, but that's you know that's almost so good because there are so few things on it, and it's hard to have both. Mm. And I think we're lucky that we have a giant community and a space where I can. Uh, make something and sign up for some credit card processing thing online and sell it, you know, from my house and then worry about the marketing. Like, that's pretty amazing to me that we don't need to put things in boxes anymore. So I think there are a lot of ways to get the traction that you need to put something on Steam if, if this is how Steam is going to work and, and that it's really not the be-all, end-all of game distribution. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. To me, it's very different for something to cost money to get on Steam than it is for something to cost money to get on XBLA or PSN or the 3DS eShop because that's those are the only marketplaces for those consoles at all. Right, exactly. Uh, it's basically yeah. like making... It's abolishing the game's existence like they did with um, Edmund McMillan's game, Binding of Isaac. That was blocked from the eShop, so it just doesn't exist. There's no way to play it on the 3DS. Still makes yeah. me sad. Uh, Vlam Beer, they're asking questions? I thought they were what? in your house. Those How bastards. can they do that? <laughs> you can just tell them to come out and ask in front of... Uh, that's Rami Esmael. He's, he's secretly hiding in Zach's mom's house as we speak. Uh, he asks, didn't you do that shitty Space Invaders ripoff where you also deleted stuff from your computer? Was that a bug? Yes, tell us about your Space Invaders uh, game. Oh, uh, Rami. Oh, he likes that game. Um, <laughs> I made a game a while back that was super contentious on the internet uh, called Lose Lose, which was uh, kind of a performance art piece and I guess sort of a little bit trolling. But the idea was I wanted to look at how weird it is that we use computers all the time um, and how important all the things that we have on computers are and how kind of unwilling we are to admit that until those things are threatened. Um, and that mm. probably seems really obvious to, like, anybody who would be watching your show, but it's not obvious to a lot of the, like, less connected internet world, especially, like, four years ago when I did the project. Like, there are a lot of people who really treat mm. computers as tools um, and not as spaces that they inhabit. And my kind of prime example was, like, 
if you have uh, wedding photos, you would probably keep them like on the wall in a frame or in a box in your attic or in like a very special place where you would take care of those things. But if you have wedding photos on your computer, they might like either still be on your camera on the, like the card or they might be in some folder called desktop junk that's on your desktop. I've actually seen people keeping important files in the trash, which blows my mind. So, like, I wanted to make something that would just drive it home so then I could talk about something else. And so the game I made was, uh, it's sort of like Space Invaders, except all the aliens that you're fighting are uh, connected to files on your computer, and they're generated out of them. So their appearance is unique, and their behavior is unique, and how much health and how fast they are is unique. Um, and w if you kill them, it deletes the file that they were generated out of, but you're not told what that file was ever. Um, and if you die, then the game deletes itself. And it tells you all of this before you play. So it was structured to be just like a really shitty situation that you could download and engage in, as opposed to a game about a really shitty situation. So like kind of on parallel with like uh, doing hard drugs or, uh, or cheating on a loved one or drinking really heavily, like something that you know is going to be like bad and everybody's told you the consequences, but you do it anyway for some reason. Uh, and then people did end up playing, which like I thought was totally insane. But yeah, <laughs> so that was that project. Wow, yeah. That's the kind of game, it's, it's, does it get, I, I, you know, I'm against the whole term art game, but there's got to be a name for games like that, that like, there's nothing about it that's feel good. Right. Everything about that was bad. Yeah. There's got to be, got to be a word for it. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. Got to get back to questions. <laughs> this is too deep in thought. Uh, the Mintian. I think I said that wrong. I apologize. How? What do you feel about the whole rage on the 3DS XL and the complaints that it is too large? What? I haven't. I there's so many parts of the internet. I guess there's a part that hates the 3DS XL. Any feelings yeah, about I, that? I didn't know that. Um, I actually really like the 3DS XL. Um, I saw it. Uh, I was hanging out with the Gaijin guys at PAX, and they had them. Um, and so I picked one up for the drive home. And uh, I really like it. I think it's uh, a little bit embarrassing that Nintendo released it after the original 3DS. It just feels really good, and it kind of mm -hmm. feels like the system they should have released in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's how they've been lately. A lot of uh, sorries after the fact from Nintendo. Hopefully that'll change with the Wii U coming up. Any thoughts about the Wii U come to, come to speak of it? You've been thinking uh, about that thing? That one I've definitely seen contention on. Um, mm. I, I like it. Uh, I'm, I really appreciate that Nintendo is still dedicated to providing experiences for people sitting together on a couch. Um, there mm. aren't a lot of games that are doing that right now, and most every company has discovered that it's not really profitable, and so they've veered away and started you know, making games for people to play with each other over the Internet. Uh, but Nintendo somehow manages to turn a profit making games for couch people, and I think that's great. Um, so I'm pretty excited about the Wii U. I'm sure it'll be like a system that's mostly supported by first-party titles, um, and there won't be that much for it, but mm -hmm. I'm psyched to play those games. I think Nintendo will make good games, and I think it's kind of doing good on a promise that they've been trying to make since they made the Game Boy Link cable um, and like started hooking up GBAs to Game Cubes. Like, they really wanted to make a, a system where people had individual screens and there was like asynchronous information for a while now, and it seems like with the Wii U, they're finally doing that, so I'm excited to see what kind mm -hmm. of games they can pump out for that. Yeah, that, uh, for some reason, every time someone other than myself who says they're excited about what Nintendo is doing, I get surprised. Like, I've just been trained to think everyone takes it as their default attitude to either be disinterested or actively annoyed with Nintendo. For existing at all. I don't know if you've experienced a lot of that or if that's just me, but yeah, it's nice to surprise you here that you don't hate the Wii U already. Well, we'll see. I mean, it's got to come out, but I, I'm optimistic. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I see Nintendo as oftentimes doing what smaller developers do, taking those kinds of risks because they, they came from their, their developers themselves. Iwata was a programmer. Miyamoto was a cartoonist and then game designer. 
They, they think like people who actually make games, which you don't always find with other developers, for better or worse. Uh, Beardy Plays asks, do you have any guilty pleasure games you love to play? Games you wouldn't want your friends to know you enjoy playing, i.e. Farmville? Yeah, why would you want to answer that publicly? But you can if you want. Or, or <laughs> no, I, I'm trying to think if I have any. Um, I don't know. I've been playing a lot of Spelunky. Um, I boot up sound shapes kind of every morning and look for new levels. Uh, and I played a lot of um, Super Hexagon. But I don't know. I guess it's a little embarrassing to have spent like eight hours on Super Hexagon at this point. But I, I'm psyched on it. I think it's great. Um, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I stay away from, from Farmville and those other games. I did try Dragon Vale just to see what it would be like. And I got the... That like it, it's I started to see its hooks and it made me uncomfortable, so I quit. Um, but I, I don't have a lot of time to, to, to play to play dumb games. I think it's really hard um, for me to find that time. I yeah. do a lot of projects. And a lot of people I know who make games, just making the game rewards them in the same way that playing a game would for other people. Like when you make a game, you have a set of rules, set of limitations, a set of goals, and it's exciting to immerse yourself in that world and then see what you can produce. So when it comes to just playing a video game for fun, a lot of them kind of exit that world in favor of, of making games. I don't know if that's happened to you. I think, I think sometimes, and I, and I think the other part of it is when I play games, I'm really looking for something uh, compelling and new that somebody did. And so when a game doesn't have that, it's really hard for me to get invested in it. Um, I think like a game recently that I was really surprised how good it was was Max Payne 3. I was kind of expecting mm. that to be just like a lot, a huge bloodbath, but the controls were so tight in the way that they designed all the levels to eventually make it so that like you started safe and covered, but then the game turned into something where you couldn't be safe all the time, um, and you would have to do mm. like crazy rolls and dives. I thought that was really cool. So like uh, sometimes I'll play through a game further than than I would expect, and then find something great. Um, but if something's just like like a grind, I, I can't do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think when I was younger anyway, I was more willing to just grind because I wasn't in this phase in life where I felt like I needed to collect all this information in order to say things and do things that are more interesting. And that's where I'm at mm. now. So if a game doesn't like give me inspiration, if it's just kind of an escape, I, I tend to, to lose track of it. Maybe that's what they mean by guilty pleasures, like games that are just meaningless? Is that what that no, even no, no. means? I don't... I don't know how to apply, like, games that you're proud to play and games you're embarrassed to play. I don't know how to apply that to my thinking at all. Yeah, I mean, it may just... Thought. Maybe we just have a bad context because all we do is talk to people about video games. So yeah. <laughs> everything is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, Lame Like Mike asks, how much do you kick around an idea before you build a rough version of the game system? Like, build a rough... Uh, usually not very long. Usually um, a game will come up and I'll sit down and build it out. Uh, I've gotten to the point where I can kind of make anything in like three hours. I can do like a rough version of, of, of any simple idea that I have. So um, mm. I'll like come up with something in the shower or something and get out of the shower and walk to my computer and write it. Um, lately I've been kicking around ideas more because I have too many um, and I don't have enough time. But but usually, usually not very long. I am working on an RPG right now, and that one has been kicked around a lot because there's just so much planning that you have to do for something like that. Um, so that one has been a bit weird, like a lot mm -hmm. more thought than prototypes so far. Yeah, RPG, that's a huge undertaking. That, that uh, Also, before I forget, Lame Like Mike wanted to know if you have any advice for someone who wants to get going in game development because he has a lot of ideas but he doesn't know how to start with them. And before you start with that, did I suddenly... Where am I now? When we well, started the show, I was <laughs> like in a normal room. Now I'm like in somebody's dungeon. I don't know what the hell happened. Sorry, viewers. <laughs> I didn't mean to get subterranean on you at the last minute. But anyway, yes. Uh, any advice for people that are aspiring game developers that don't know where to start? Yeah, um, I think the... I mean... Rami and I tend to say the same thing, which is just get started, like figure out a way to get started. Um, there are so many ways to get started in game design that don't require very many skills. Um, either finding uh, something simple like Game Maker 
or simpler like Scratch, which is an MIT thing that's sort of to teach you how to code or processing if you want to do coding. Or uh, if that's still too much, just uh, getting some dice and a piece of paper and trying to come up with games with that. I think a lot of the times you play games that are big and you come up with ideas that are big because that's what you're seeing. Um, but it's really hard to get started with any kind of big idea. And the, 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 the much better way to do it, I think, is to say you want to make games and then sit down and say, okay, well, what kind of game could I make? Like, what could I do right now, this afternoon, that would be a game and try and make it um, whatever that is. And once you do that, then you start to... Uh, find tangents in that that are fun. Like if you're making a game with dice, maybe the dice roll some weird way and that gets you thinking on something and then you have a game and you follow that. Um, it's just really important to start at the beginning and spend a lot of time and then it's not that hard. Speaking of dice, I don't know if you did this intentionally. Ah, this is a no. fantastic segue. You made a game with dice? A Kickstarter, in fact called Guts of Glory, is that right? Yeah, well, there are no dice, technically. It's it's a card oh. game with boards, but oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's my first board game, um, which has been really fun. I like to really do different things. It's really hard for me to do, like, the same thing more than once. So, uh, like, right now mm. that I'm doing game design, I'm, I feel like I'm just trying to, like, prove to myself that I can design different types of games and that I'm not a total idiot. So I, like, did the puzzle game, like, the action puzzle game, and then I did the action arcade game, and then I did the word game, and now I'm like, all right, now I'm going to do a, a, a board game, and maybe, I, like, if I can do all these different things, then maybe I, I don't totally suck as a designer. So I, I just did this board game, um, Guts of Glory, which is on Kickstarter right now. Uh, and we're almost almost there, which is pretty exciting. Kickstarter is pretty uh, harrowing, but we're almost to our goal, and we have a lot of days left, so I think we're going to make mm. it. Um, but it's basically a, a competitive uh, food what, game. What kind of game is it? Yeah. It's a card game, uh, and it's a competitive eating game set in the post-apocalypse, um, but not in like a pandering zombies way, more in like a super weird surrealist way. Um, where you're just eating strange things. And the, the idea with it was I wanted to make a card game that had the compelling points of, of magic or ascension or dominion, like the parts for me that are like tactical turn-by-turn -turn play, where you have cards and you're trying to combo them and stuff, but without the overhead of magic and ascension where you have to learn a thousand cards. Like I wanted to have a card game that I could go to somebody's house and teach them in five minutes and play and have it be competitive. Um, so it's like... A, Let's see, I have some cards. Um, I don't know. They're basically like the cards are split into sort of two different types of cards. Um, there are like foods and condiments, and uh, the style of the game is that you're eating these different things, and they all have different toughnesses, so you're like trying to swallow them to activate points and powers, but you can only have a certain number of them in your mouth at once. So you're balancing trying to have like a super powerful mouth with powerful cards that combo off of each other versus the danger of having to eat something you don't have room for. Because um, if you don't have room in your mouth and you have to eat, which happens all the time because it's an eating contest, then you have to spew a card at your opponent. And when you spew, the cards gain glory and you're competing for glory. It's a race to seven glory. So like if you spew a card, um, it gets better than it was when it was in your mouth. So it's like, because... Uh, because if you, uh, it's more glorious to swallow something that someone spewed at you than to eat something off of a plate, obviously. So um, you're trying to balance like having a powerful mouth versus uh, accidentally spewing points and great cards at your opponents. So it, that makes it kind of um, accessible because there's this larger system, this like spewing and balancing system that kind of counteracts the powers a little bit. So sometimes if somebody's really knowledgeable about the game, they might still get in a bad situation where they have to spew and kind of understand what they're doing in, in a different way. <laughs> wow. I feel so boring. <laughs> have I ever done anything that interesting in my life? I've done some things. I was with Kaiju Big Battle for a little while. We were monster wrestlers. I was on a reality show on MTV. I worked for Destructoid, pretty interesting website. I have never done anything as interesting as create a uh, competitive eating slash competitive vomiting. Maybe not vomiting, but projectile, projecting food out of your mouth into your opponent's 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you did, you did it. You did it. You Good. can go to go to your deathbed happy now, knowing that no one has ever done anything like that. Probably never will again. And it's almost funded. It's going to be a real thing. It sounds like. That yeah. You can buy. Pretty wow. crazy. I am yes. looking forward to holding a thing in my hands. Okay. I me too. I'm buying it day one, and I uh, I've never really played card games. I played some Dungeons and Dragons, geez, 25 years ago. But uh, wow, hey, any chance you'll turn that into a uh, a video game as well? I could see that working. Um, we've definitely thought about it. Uh, it's really it's got some issues um, for like the idea that seems viable is like having an asynchronous iPhone game where you like play a turn and then send it to your opponent. But it has some issues because there's a lot of inner turn mechanics. So like in the middle of my turn, I might spew a card at you and you might have to like counter spew a card to accept it. And then I might counter spew a card back at you to take that card. So right. like that kind of situation is really nasty over the internet when you're waiting for someone to take a turn. Um, but I'm definitely looking at it. Uh, mm, yeah. At this point, I really want to like I really wanted to make a board game that celebrated board games and being with other people at a table, and so all my uh, intentions right now are going towards just making a really great thing to get together with your friends and play. Um, but it's not out of the cards, so to speak, that it be a, an, an iOS thing or a video game at some point. You. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it working on the Wii U, two screen there. You know, uh, you, one person's got their mouth on the TV. You've got your mouth on the uh, gamepad screen, and you're touching stuff on the screen and spewing and chewing. and Yeah, well, it was just a thought. And I know some of the Gaijin guys are actually Wii U developers. They may, they may help you with that. They're pretty interesting dudes. That's nice that you know them. I, I like them a lot. They're uh, Yeah, they are, aren't they? They're awfully nice. Uh, okay, what else we got? Wasting Sanity asks, what is your more recent game addiction and most recent disappointment in a game? Hmm. Well, my most recent game addiction is definitely Super Hexagon. Um, mm -hmm. And then also Spelunky. Disappointments. That's a harder one, I think, because I just put them out of memory. Um, yeah. Let me think on that one and come back to it. <laughs> sure, absolutely. It's, yeah, I would imagine that you've gotten a pretty good idea of what you like and what you don't like, so if something's going to not work for you, you know before you even start playing it. That's how you seem to me. You seem to be a oh, guy who... I know. I know what it is. Yeah? The, the new Super Mario Brothers game for the DS. Oh, new Super Mario Brothers 2? I hate it. It's so disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about that. That's another one where <laughs> the fans love it and get angry when anyone says it's no okay. good. They, uh -oh. they say it's out of... Um, well, it's okay. People get angry on the internet all the time. It's nothing uh -oh. personal. That's yeah, I don't know. It just it feels like it feels a little soulless. I don't it I'll tell you the moment that made me uncomfortable was there are these parts where you step on a switch and there's like a pipe in the sky and coins just fall out of the pipe and you just stand there and you like mm -hmm. jump to get the coins and it feels like there's like it's just teasing you with these coins and you're just like this stupid idiot jumping to get these coins and they're making fun of you because they could just give you the coins but instead they're making you jump and it was just like such a disturbing behavior to me that I couldn't keep playing like, I was really upset <laughs> it's got yeah I could see I I had this weird it hit me like a ton of bricks when I first played it at E3 this year that Nintendo were desperate for money so they were making a game that's all about you being desperate for money yeah. because uh, they, they had their stocks drop and the 3DS didn't sell up to expectations and third parties were moving away from it and the Vita was, you know, supposedly going to take over. So they, yeah, they, it think, depressed me. It's a well-made yeah. game. The, the level design is still good, but yeah. the, 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 the cash grab aspect of it is hard to ignore. I think maybe as like a, a meta project, I'm impressed that when they needed money, they made a game about needing money and that, that's pretty cool. But I don't like playing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. For actual fun, it does make you feel like the meaning of the, the coin collecting has been lost because there's so many of them. Yeah. It's just turned into to total mindlessness, in, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. Steve asks, what artists do you follow in general? Not just artists who make games or develop games. Yeah, people like to know about just art in general. Do you have um, any feelings about that? 
most of the people who I follow are like just people who I know um, in my community uh, in New York. Mm. So I really like um, there's this guy Zach Lieberman who makes these really crazy uh, interactive works. Um, he's doing this thing right now in London with these giant LED balloons that are like lit across like uh, miles and miles of this wall. It's very cool. Um, and uh, just, uh, there are a lot of other interactive artists. I really like some of the stuff that's coming out of, uh, there's a place in New York called iBeam that I just did a residency at um, where they have people uh, just making crazy, crazy, crazy art. Um, really strange interactive stuff. Um, I'm blanking on names right now, but one of my favorite artists who okay. isn't somebody who you can particularly follow, but is someone who I just like think is great, is there was an artist named An Kawara. Um, they may still be alive, I'm not sure, but they do paintings that are like a, uh, it's just a date, so it's like a, it's, it's a process artist, so a lot of the paintings are like just a date, like it'll just say like May 12th, 1972, and it was just a painting of that, and that was made on that day, or there are like books there are just hundreds of dates that are written in individually every single day. So it's like a, a volume of like every single day between like 1910 and 2013. And it's just one entry for every day that just says the date. Um, I don't know what, for some reason that stuff I just find like really compelling. Um, and then I, I guess like there are people doing games with like art stuff with games that I think is really amazing. I think the stuff that Doug Wilson is doing is really cool. Um, kind of trying to push games into more of a physical space. Uh, I have a friend, Amit Pitaru, who I had collaborated with um, on the Sonic Wire Sculptor iPhone game, mm -hmm. which was like a, a sound toy that we had adapted from one of his installations that he'd been showing all over the world, and he does a lot of great stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of people. Sorry, I'm like blanking on exact names right now. There's a guy who I really like, actually. Who oh, is, no, that was tons of stuff for people to go look up. That's There's a guy who I really like whose name I can't remember, but which is embarrassing because I literally just did a residency and he was there. Um, but he did a project where he harvested a ton of people's uh, pictures and interests from Facebook. He, like, illegally scraped it and then made a dating website that used their information without telling them. So you could search for like people by interest and all this stuff would come up. Um, and then you could like find somebody who, who you liked, but they had never signed up on the website. Nobody had signed up. It was only made out of this like data that he had stolen. Um, that I thought was really awesome. But I can't wow, remember what yeah. it's called or his name, which is awful. Ah, it's okay. It'll come. I know how it is when you're talking to a stranger on the internet and people are watching. <laughs> brain doesn't work in quite the same way. It happens to me all the time, at least a couple times a week. Uh, that, that brings me to some other projects I want people to know about that you did before uh, we move on. Because yikes, we only have 22 minutes left in the show. You oh, did yeah. a Twitter account that is all about joy. Yes. And you, yeah. Well, we'll start with that one. Talk about your Twitter joy. Uh, so that's best best day ever, um, and I did that a couple of years ago. Um, there are a lot of Twitter bots now that I think are really interesting, but a couple of years ago there weren't uh, so many. And what I was playing with was I felt like there was this like lie, this like base lie that was told to us about social networks that when you get on a social network you're going to meet all of these fantastic strangers and um, the world is your oyster and you will interact with everybody. Uh, but what actually happens is you join and you like basically talk to your friends and sometimes you shout at strangers who rarely shout back at you and then you follow a bunch of famous people and it's not like that beautiful mm -hmm. world um, it's better it's a little bit more open but it's not totally open um, and but it is totally open for like the people monetizing the mm -hmm. information because they can uh, sort of turn all the information into numbers and those numbers are really interesting and useful for when you're trying to target ads or make money um, so I wanted to do a project that would figure out how to make that like massive space of strangers interesting and compelling. Um, and so it couldn't be uh, about numbers. It had to be about something that was sort of more base and emotional. And I discovered that if I searched for the phrase best day ever in quotes, a lot of times the thing that came out was really interesting because we attach so much information and context when somebody says that their day was the best day ever. Um, so I made this robot that would every day at 6.30 uh, retweet or grab and steal and then tweet some stranger's things so you wouldn't really know who it was coming from 
Um, but it would just be like a schizophrenic friend who's having the greatest day of their life every single day. Um, and they've been pretty interesting and weird. One of the ones that I really uh, made me feel like the project was being successful early on was one that said, uh, it was in all caps, and it was like, yeah, best day ever, no homework for the first time ever. And like, I remember that day when I was in third grade and that happened to me. And like, I just, it was the first day since they introduced homework that there wasn't homework. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was really cool that like, from like a hundred characters that I had harvested randomly from the internet, I could remember this great experience. Um, also, sometimes they're weird. The, the, the absolute first one I ever tweeted was, uh, OMG, my uncle stopped bleeding, best day ever. And I was like, wow, that's strange. Because <laughs> you would not typically say OMG when it happened. Like, I <laughs> imagine there's, like, more. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> even... <laughs> yeah, even when they're disappointing or, or without content... There's something interesting to them, I find. Just like, she did it. Best yeah. day ever. I'll be like, well, yeah, that's all you're going to tell me? But the, for, for that person, that was enough. Um, yeah, I, I suggest everyone follow that Twitter account. I just started today and researching oh, cool. Zach, and I, I love it. This is, you don't have a lot of followers for it yet either, which was disappointing to me. Uh, um, I don't know. I, I'm, it's a, so the, the Twitter account is at my best day ever. And uh, I don't know, I'm kind of, it, there's not a lot on it, but I'm sort of happy because I don't want people seeding tweets. Like, I think if there were too many followers, people oh, would true. To figure out how it's, it's doing things and then start gaming it, um, which I'm sure now people will do because I've, I've said it. Right, right, right. Well, they, you know, hopefully they'll respect, well, what am I saying? It's the internet. Forget it. <laughs> I use it's the word okay. respect and internet in the same word. That wasn't a good idea. My dog just started trying to unplug my computer. Got a little oh. distracted. Sorry. Uh, Slow Holmes asks, a lot of people are making really interesting games are also heavily limiting the medium they are accessible through. Do you think the amount that this aids the game experience outweighs the inconvenience that it creates? I think I know what he means by that. Yeah. yeah. Limiting. He's talking about like Joust and Bennett, Fadi and Doug and the stuff that they're doing. They just did something with trampolines that looked awesome. Um, I don't know. Okay. I think it's good that people are pushing it. Um, I, I just any any time somebody's doing something that's really experimental, I'm happy with, um, even if it's limited. I think mm -hmm. the discussion of something like that is really worthwhile. Um, I taught a class once about making experimental games, and somebody did a project where it was like that classic tank game where you have like a little uh, tank on a hill, and the other person has a tank on the hill, and you're adjusting the angle and your power um, to shoot them, but, and you take turns. But in this game, uh, the only way to take a turn was to drop a coin in a coin slot, and he gave you some coins at the beginning. And so you start by like dropping a coin, and then it would take a shot. But very quickly, you realize that, first of all, you can take as many shots as you want as long as you have coins. It's not strictly turn-based. And then the other thing is that it doesn't care what kind of mm. money you're putting into it. So if you're playing someone who's got 100 pennies and you have 100 quarters, you're spending way more money to fight this little digital war than they are just by mm. virtue of like your context. And that was like super interesting, and that's I think something that would have been very hard to convey in any other kind of context. Um, definitely, it wouldn't have been something mm -hmm. that you could do in an afternoon, which he had just gone home, done this homework, and brought it back in, and it was sort of fascinating. So I think it's great that people are doing this stuff. I do wish um, some of them were more accessible. I know Joust is something that Doug wants to get out there, and he's working on that. Um, but I don't know. I'm glad. I think there are places to explore within the system. Um, that are distributable, and there are places that let you do crazy things that you can only do if you build a thing uh, and keep it to yourself. So as long as people are talking about it and posting videos on the Internet, I'm happy. Yeah, thanks to the Internet. If it weren't for the Internet, I would say it's not worth it, that it's depressing that all these really interesting games are impossible to find, but... These days, really, all you have to do is have the, the interest and the will to look and to, to ask people yeah. who may know, and you can find just about anything. <sighs> so, do you know anything about the history of film? Oh, God, probably not as much as I should. Why? <laughs> I wouldn't say that. You know, so you've already, you're 27 and you're already teaching classes and being a resident? That's insane. Yeah. What have you done with your life? You're already a total champion. Good uh, God. Ah, oh, my envy through the roof. Your hair, 
how nice your hair is. <laughs> Why can't I be you, Zach Cage? Why? You can. Why? I, I can? don't know how. I don't know how, can you? but probably. Let's figure that out after this. I'm, I'd actually like to take a break, so if you want to swap, we can, we could do that. <laughs> Likewise, if you ever want to yeah. host the show, totally. you'd be fantastic at it. You're an uh, open invitation to, to fill Let's in for me if you want. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. No, don't, don't, don't tempt me like that. Uh, it's really interesting. I've been looking into the history of film more lately because I'm working on... People are really mad at me because I said I thought the term art games is stupid. People got really super mad. And, mm. uh, and I, I don't blame them. You, you, you criticize people for using a term... I didn't mean to put it that way, but that's how they took it. And don't give them a term to replace it with that works better for them, that resonates better for them, and they just feel like you're being a nitpicky, pretentious jerk. So I've been trying to research a better term, and I looked into film, because art game kind of came from art film. And they didn't always used to call small films that didn't fit into the mainstream art films. They used to call them grindhouse movies. Huh. So it used to be that the mainstream was willing to do like films with artistic integrity with meaning and ideas. So the counterculture was only left with just doing gore and, and boobs and um, scares like scares of VD or scares of African Americans and what like that. So that became the exploitation genre. And I find it really interesting that right now in video games anyway, it's like a, the exact opposite. Like, the, the mainstream games are all about gore and boobs and scares, whereas the small independent people seem to be leaning towards doing what the mainstream won't do, which is games that are about more than that. Uh, at least that's what uh, that's how I take it. What, what do you think of that thought? That's, that's crazy fascinating. I never thought about that like that. Um, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know oh. that that's where art films started, but it makes, like, that, that they were grindhouse um, that makes sense. I don't know. That's really cool. Let me think. I don't know. I think like art. I, mean, I art. did something smart. I did something smart <laughs> to the smart guy. Yes. What? You've been blowing my mind the whole show. I've been like, oh, how am I supposed oh, to respond to how smart this guy is? And no. I did it. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know. I, I agree. I think that like art games are, are a bit of a weird term, but not only because everybody attaches their own thing, which I think is what you said. I, I can't remember. Yeah. I think it came up when you were talking to John um, Van Blow about it. And, and yeah, it is, it is a bit weird. I think like any time you have a broad term. I actually think indie games is a really shitty term. Um, mm. Forget art games. Like you go to in, an indie gaming convention and you see what other people are doing and there are people who are experimenting with totally weird stuff. There are people who are making games that are kind of mainstream but a little bit weird. There are people who are trying to make totally mainstream games but happen to be self-funded. Um, I think like everything is getting a little bit messy right now with terminology and games mm -hmm. just because they're so new and we really don't know how to discuss them very well. Um, and yeah. And actually I think there's something weird going on with the internet and like contemporary culture in the last hundred years where like everybody talks about things like since widespread communication happened everybody's been really bad at naming things I don't know what happened but like when you look at the last three types of art that have come around it was like modernism postmodernism uh, new media and then contemporary art there's actually a type of art called contemporary art like god we thought our terms were trouble like art that's stupid. How many more words for new are we going to come up with? Just, like, name something. Um, I think, like, a, a long time ago when there were less people doing stuff, it's, like, it was much easier to, like, either look back and name something because there wasn't a name or the number of people doing something. It was so small that they could just name it whatever they wanted, and that's what people would call it. But now with all this conversation, you get these terms thrown around. And that, I think it's a much bigger yeah. issue than just indie games and art games. Like, bigger than our community. I mean, look at what happened to music. I don't know how to describe music anymore. Absolutely. That's I hadn't thought of great. that. It's, uh, it's very similar. So. Cool. Dubstep? It's all just dubstep or pop, I guess? Right. Yeah, I guess dubstep is. That is I mean, that's, a, that's a good term, I guess. I do know what that means, so that's good. It's a successful term. I think so. <laughs> pop yeah, is that's not one a great of you. <laughs> Yeah, it just means that you think it was made for everybody. And they were getting old. 
<laughs> Thank you, Sinistar, for pointing out that I am old and don't know what kids like anymore at all. I'm uh, trying to do this show called Teenage Pokemon, and it's about Pokemon that are teenagers, and I don't know how teenagers talk, so I'm just guessing that they all sound like Ving Rames or Scarface. <laughs> so that's how that show is going to turn out. I'm doing all the voices myself. Wish me, wish me oh, luck on that. Uh, that's I, uh, I don't even know how teenagers talk. It's, so. it's, and at my age, it's not something I can just find out. I can't just be like, teenagers, mind if I spend a few hours with you, see how you talk? That's not weird. <laughs> For a sleepy bald man to just be near you for a sure. while at McDonald's, yeah, you can't bring that. a camera and then you're good. Yeah, that's a, don't talk to them; just film them from a distance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's actually <laughs> won't be weird at all. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably do it because you're. No, I don't think so. I don't think. Well, I think not only. Say again. Oh no. I did get carded the other day. Yeah, I could. But I don't. Yeah, you you could do it a variety of different ways. Not only are you not old looking, but you have ways to collect information about people. One thing I definitely wanted to touch upon before we go. We only have ten minutes left. You have this thing that you can enter your email into. Uh, I guess a computer program you wrote, and it will Google you and learn about you. Yeah, That's, yeah. Talk, tell us about that. That's a really interesting idea. So it's uh, the what it's actually doing is is uh, is very vague. But the idea with the program was that I wanted to do. Uh, sometimes when I'm trying to make art projects, they come out of ideas and things that I want to talk about, and sometimes they come out of experiences. And that project came out of this experience that I had, where when I was younger, um, when I was ten, my dad died, and so he kind of died before the internet really happened. And I had this experience late at night where, I, just for the hell of it, I decided to Google him, even though I knew that there would be no information about him because it was long before the internet. And uh, it was really weird searching for somebody who wasn't there, who didn't exist on the internet. Um, it was just a strange experience knowing that they wouldn't be there. And so I wanted to build something that kind of captured that in some way, and it took a lot of thinking to come up with. But what I ended up doing was looking at this idea of how we tend to remember people um, by searching them, uh, even casually, like if we met someone and we want to show someone what they do or we want to talk about them, we'll just look them up and then we know all the information about them. Um, and so there's this Jewish idea of uh, somebody not actually being forgotten if somebody who's living still remembers what their name is. And so I wanted to play with that and look at it on the internet and think like, okay, so if this idea is based around memory, and if memory is now being a, a function of actually Googling, then maybe like Googling for somebody is an act of remembering them. Um, and I, I, th I think it is. I think that's like fairly inarguable. And so given that like computers are really weird, uh, you don't actually need a person to Google someone. You could build a robot that would Google someone. That would browse around on websites that it found um, and then kind of move on. So the project is this piece of software that sits on the wall and is connected by Ethernet. And every 20 minutes, it Googles one name on its list of names that it has. Um, and it just browses around a little bit. And it doesn't save any information. It doesn't collect anything. It just acts like a human would when they look at something. Um, and so the question is kind of, is that something that makes you feel better about yourself if everybody who you knew forgot about you or died or didn't exist anymore, but there was a robot that was Googling you, would that make you feel more comfortable? Are you then in some way still alive and around, or is that the same as if everybody forgetting you entirely? So, I don't know. <laughs> That's the project. Yeah, and, and, and my immediate emotional reaction is, oh, no, my God. <laughs> That's an interesting emotional reaction. I'm sorry, guys. Dog, really, come on. KK, come here. Come, come, sorry. It's okay. Dogs, human beings everywhere. She's just barking at a corner. Just a corner of her room. Come here, KK, come. Come. Anyway, like I was saying, I'm just going to pat my leg while I talk. Okay, nope. We're just doing the entire show. How loud is that? Scale from 1 to 10. Uh, I don't know. Uh, 8. Seven. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty loud. I threw something in the air. Ah, that works. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, I just uh, I don't like have a room I can put my dog in because she'll just bark in that room if I put her there. So she's okay. taking over my life. I've had her for like a month. It's been a nightmare. Anyway, uh, 
I do feel better about your program thinking about me. For some reason that like instinctually I was like, oh, I've got to enter that thing so I'll be important to computers or to your one computer program and it'll focus on me. It's a, it's a weird thing that uh, intrinsically we want to be remembered and we want to be a part of something, even if it's an artificial intelligence. It's a yeah. really interesting thing you touched upon there. And we have five minutes left. I didn't ask you what the video game was that got you interested in making video games. I didn't ask you if you think video games are uh, why they're attractive to you as an artistic medium when you have all these other mediums at your disposal while you end up focusing on video games. I, I, oh, so many things I didn't ask you. Oh, I feel like I'm such a jerk. That's okay. Is there any of that? Yeah. Okay, it passed. Uh, Super Mario Brothers was the first video game I ever played, and it blew my mind, and that probably started me wanting to make video games, although I kind of feel like every indie I've ever met was really inspired to make video games because they played some RPG. Um, and then they wanted to make an RPG, and then they mm. found out that that's fucking impossible. Um, so the, mine was Secret of Mana really blew my mind. Uh, that was the game where I was like, okay, I need to, I need to put something into this medium. Um, I can't believe that this is a thing that somebody could make. Um, as for why I'm making them and not mm. doing them from other stuff, I kind of, I don't know, I think I'm sort of hooked on them right now because the problems to solve are so clear. Like, I can actually put a box around, uh, I want to make a board game. Like, that's a new thing that I can definitely do. And I, I think I've gotten really hooked on solving those problems. I think eventually I'll probably switch back to some kind of conceptual art thing. But at the moment, it's just so compelling to try all these different things and, like, have them just waiting there for me. Like, when you, when you do, like, conceptual art, it's a lot harder because there aren't, like, 90 genres of art. I mean, you have things like, I want to make an art piece about OkCupid okay because OkCupid okay blows my mind and it's like the weirdest thing ever. But, um, but it's harder to find those topics than it is in video games. And, and I think in the end also, video games are way more complex and involved than a lot of art pieces. There's a lot more to solve and balance than, than when you just like, make one thing. <laughs> That's OK. Just keep going. <laughs> Absolutely. I was listening hard and also thinking of ways to shut up my dog. There's a coffee cup. Eat it. Eat my cup. It worked. Hey. She's going to eat the cup for the last three minutes, I hope. Chew it up. I just spilled coffee all over my shirt, man. That's how desperate I was to shut up my dog so I could listen to you be so smart. Uh, do you have any pets? Uh, I don't. I had a dog when I was growing up. But, but uh, I live in, in New York City. It's really hard to have a pet unless you have, like, a like a, uh, a girlfriend who lives with you, and I just, just got a girlfriend who lives with me, so we'll see about a pet oh. maybe someday. <laughs> right. Well, I was going to just give you the show to have. <laughs> Sup, Zach. It would be great. Uh, but if you're going to get a pet, I'm not sure, because I really... Dogs just ruin in my show and my life. Uh, we have two, three minutes left. What do you want to tell the people? Is there any projects you're working on other than Guts of Glory or any things you want to... We barely talked about BitPilot, which is unfortunate. That's still on the iOS <laughs> marketplace. It's, a, uh, a, a, it's not a shooter, though it looks no, like a shooter at first glance. It's in this, yeah, it's an escaper, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell them about that briefly. Then I guess we'll uh, wrap. Bit, Bit Pilot is uh, the game that I wanted to make because I wanted to make an, uh, an actual action game on the iPhone. Um, I think it's really hard to make action games on touch devices because you can't feel buttons. Um, and most action games actually rely on the feel of buttons. So like in Mario when you're running, I actually gave a talk um, <laughs> at GDC about this, about how to design controls for, uh, for touch interfaces and one of the big problems is like when you play a game like Mario when you jump you're not looking at the screen to jump you're feeling the button going and that's like your first 100% like thing telling you that yes you actually totally did jump um, and so it's weird to try and do that on a touch device it's a lot harder because you don't know um, you don't have that feeling of jumping. And so uh, there, I don't really feel like there are a lot of action games on the iPhone. Most of them, what people would consider an action game, like a dual stick shooter, they're really like strategic placement games because after you make a move, you look at the screen to make mm. sure that everything's okay. You don't have that moment where you're just doing something and you like can't visualize it. Your thumbs are just working and like you're playing the game and it's magic. And I wanted to make a game that had that, that like had that flow state. 
Um, so my solution in BitPilot was to have when you make gestures that uh, pushes your ship and you're trying to dodge all these asteroids, but you can also use two thumbs instead of one thumb and that gives you more force if those thumbs are in the same direction or force if those thumbs are in different directions that like counteracts each other. So it's like a, um, you get like the feel, like it works because you can feel how your thumbs move and so you have that internal body sense of what's going on and that replaces the physical feel of a button going down. Um, mm. I think it's really interesting because one of the only other action games I think of on the iPhone, like really truly action, uh, is Super Hexagon, and he's using the same character I'm using. We both have a little triangle guy, <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe that little yeah, triangle. yeah, it's big. And um, oh. a new rec- oh what we're wrapping it up I think oh. soon. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah we're doing it. Uh, and, oh another character that uses the triangle is um. Swift Stitch, you should play yeah, that. Yeah, and that is yeah, also one. Yeah. yeah, and follow so, Zach on the Twitters. J- Zach, what's your Twitter? Helvetica, like the font. Yeah, yeah, it's great. You've got a funny little icon. He's like a kind of what is that guy? Like a clam with eyes? <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, it's supposed to be a tree with two little people under it, but some people think it's a clam with eyes, and some people think it's a mushroom cloud. So, uh, I'm, I'm okay with the ambiguity. Yeah, yeah, just like you. Yeah, so good. You're such a good guest. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm touching Thanks my dog. To keep it. Anytime. Man, this I wish awesome. you could just... Was it okay? Yeah, this was really fun. What a relief. Yeah, it was really fun for me, too. I had a fantastic time. Yeah, I guess that's all. And listen to us on iTunes. We're on iTunes. This will be on there soon. If you're just checking out the show for the first time, there's a whole backlog. You can check out Jonathan Blow, Anthony Birch, Anna Anthropy, Rami Ismail, uh, so many people have been on the show. It's been such a blessing. You guys are willing to show up and talk to me and you know, my dog barks. Rats. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. Goodbye. Well, first, Holmes was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. Stop, Holmes.